Same-sex marriage is now legal in Minnesota. And could the gridlock on transportation funding open up? We detail in Capital Report. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Capital Report. I'm Julie Bartke. Dozens of new laws take effect in Minnesota on August 1st. One of those arguably defines the 2013 legislative session. The bill that allows for same-sex marriage passed the Minnesota legislature on May 13th. It was quickly signed into law by Governor Mark Dayton. The passage comes just one year after voters defeated a measure to place a ban on same-sex marriage in the state's constitution. The law that recognizes same-sex marriage in the state of Minnesota takes effect on August 1st. Joining me right now is the senator who championed this legislation last session. Thanks for joining us, Senator Scott Dibble. Thanks. We appreciate it. Thanks, Julie. And again, you carried this legislation in the Senate, right. Representative Karen Clark in the House, and we, we spoke to you immediately following its mm -hmm. passage. The dust has settled a bit now, and everybody's mm -hmm. ramping up for Thursday. Right. What about with you personally? Has the excitement kind of leveled off, or do you, does it still continue to grow every day? Um, you know, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, this is such an amazing thing that's happened, and uh, sometimes it's so big that you just kind of have to step away from it for a little bit. But even just today, I was thinking about how amazing it's going to be on Thursday when I see friends of mine. You know, there are friends of mine who have been together for 38 years. And so they're celebrating their 38th anniversary by getting married. We like to say their courtship went quite well and they're ready to take this step. And the nation, of course, was watching, continues to watch. Do you personally feel any pressure that Minnesota step up and make sure that things do go sm smoothly for all of those people who are going to be in line to get married, not just this week, but in the coming months? Yeah, but you know, I don't think there's anything really complicated about this whole issue. Uh, people get married every day in Minnesota. So this is just simply allowing folks who have fallen in love and want to build a life together and uh, make that commitment in front of friends and family and um, you know start moving on with their lives uh, you know it's just the same thing so you know I, I think there will be uh, a little bit of logistical uh, issues to handle because so many folks who have been waiting to get married so there's going to be you know a little bit of a you know an issue with the pipeline you know because a lot of folks trying to get through that queue pretty quickly um, so I think county clerk's offices will be pretty busy and I do know, um, you know, a number of folks who are having more traditional weddings and in, in, in wedding venues and are looking to have the flowers and the catering and all that stuff are having a hard time because there's a lot of competition for services and space right now. But I think everything will be just fine. It'll all work out. And uh, what, what will really be interesting to see is what Minnesotans are thinking and saying about this whole subject in a few months' time, in a year's time. They're going to see that just like in Iowa and Massachusetts, California, all kinds of places, um, life just moves on. What about for you personally? What does this all mean? Uh, it's beyond anything I can even describe. To, to know that uh, I enter a state of full citizenship starting August 1st, that I will be married to my husband in Minnesota. I won't be a legal stranger to him. I won't have this weird bifurcated dual existence where we're married in California, we're not married here. Combined with, of course, the fact that the Supreme Court chose to completely overturn the Defense of Marriage Act at the federal level, so we'll have all the rights and benefits as U.S. citizens at the same time. It's going to be really amazing. Senator, there's no way to smoothly transition from that topic to our next, so let's just get right on to it. The transportation issues facing Minnesota. You are a chair of the Senate Transportation uh -huh. Committee. So according to a recent article in the St. Paul Legal Ledger Capital mm -hmm. Report, two transportation funding sources are about to run dry. They are the, um, the trunk fu highway funds mm -hmm. and some federal dollars. Right. and this is going to cost approximately $250 million when the next fiscal cycle begins in two years. It's not a budget year next session, but have you already begun to address this issue? Oh, absolutely, yeah. It's what we call the fiscal cliff, and so we're going to see a severe drop-off in our ability to continue the same level of services and around transportation, whether that's keeping up our roads and keeping them free of potholes or building additional capacity or you know making sure that we're providing appropriate levels of transit service. It's going to be uh, Minnesotans will really notice the difference. I mean, already we just we just had a report a couple of weeks ago that came out of the Reason Foundation that showed Minnesota rural roads are 49th out of 50 states in terms of upkeep, accidents, capacity. I mean, we, we're at the back of the line now. Transportation is supposed to be one of those things that really aids 
our economy, but transportation, if you don't keep up with it, can be a constraint on your ability to economically grow. And we're getting to that point in Minnesota. So we're starting to really pull together the stakeholders, develop a campaign to have that broader discussion with the public about getting ready for 2014 and pursuing, again, this transportation bill that we passed in the Senate, but ran into the ground in, in uh, the House and the governor wasn't too enthusiastic. And he really wants the commissioner to go out and help tell the story and, and create the the political momentum to get something good done on transportation. And in your opinion, what is the story? What are you doing to try to get all the shareholders in place? Well, you know, just really talking about how, you know, we either pay now or we pay later. You pay a little bit of money, you invest in the form of uh, some resources, some revenue, uh, and you get so much return on the dollar. You know, in, by some measures, six to one for roads, 11 to one for transit. This money, a dollar in for transit, you get that much out in terms of economic output and productivity and in improving people's lives, or we pay in the form of decreased capacity, lost economic opportunity, congestion, the inability of getting goods to services, inability for people to get home and spend time with their family. That's real money. So we're paying regardless. Either we're paying in a productive way or we're paying in a way that really detracts from the state. And we get out and we talk about that. And people really understand this is something that the public sector does, that we do all together as people. We come together, we build roads, provide for transit service, and our lives get better and our economy improves, and we just engage that conversation. Where those dollars come from seem to have been the, the sticky point thus far, right. trying to pass a higher sales tax on gas or gas tax. Right. The governor didn't really have an appetite for it. Mm -hmm. Some members of the GOP did, some members of the DFL didn't, yeah, right. some members right. in the Senate voted down. So first, let's talk about this. Is it something you'll even bother pursuing next session? Is it something that you think you can get people on board with, or do you need to buy, find other viable options here for dollars? Well, I'm all ears if people have great ideas for other viable options, but for the time being, um, I think the gas tax in terms of roads and bridge funding, along with you know our license to have fees or motor vehicle sales tax, are gonna carry the freight. Um, there, there's some other places where we can go to, to do some additional financing, you know, some, some other stuff, but none of that really uh, gets to the level of, of productivity that we, that we need to get to for the time being. There's other ideas out there, but they're going to take some, some time to develop around mileage-based user fees or something like that, taxing alternative forms of, of fuel, you know, but, but we're just really not going to be able to, to find the, the capacity. I think absolutely it's about, and the, the, governor's, the governor's admonition was go out and create the the political space, the, the larger public will to get something even bigger done than was even proposed last year. So we take his direction to heart and I think that's our task. Senator, in your opinion, is Minnesota currently at a crossroads as far as transportation funding is concerned? Uh, Minnesota is absolutely at a crossroads. We can make a decision to make these investments now or we'll just continue to fall further and further behind. Right now the metro area, Twin Cities metropolitan area, is behind. Uh, it's not about maintaining our place, it's not about um, you know, st staying ahead of the game. We've fallen behind a number of other metropolitan areas with whom we compete for mobility, uh, for economic vitality, for those quality of life investments. Transportation is a key part of that. Young professionals who are looking for where they want to live, they're looking for the emerging metropolitan areas that offer the quality, the type of life, and the amenities that they want. They're very mobile and they're very uh, particular about what they want. They want vital, vibrant, urban areas. And we don't have that to offer right now because we have a really deficient, substandard, second-rate transit system in this metro area that gives, you know, that creates the kind of, kind of public realm amenities and infrastructure that, that young professionals just aren't interested in. So we can make a decision that we're gonna continue to be a competitive state, top tier, or we're just gonna to have to settle for mediocrity. Okay, with those words, Senator Scott Dibble, thank you for coming in and sharing your thoughts on both of these topics. We appreciate your time as always. Great, thanks Julie. Transportation funding has moved to the forefront of legislative priorities for the 2014 session, and Governor Mark Dayton says he's waiting to see what plan lawmakers come up with to fund and potentially improve Minnesota's transportation system. Doing some more street repairs and road repairs is gonna be necessary, but it's not gonna get what people are gonna looking for it. They're looking for major improvements. That's what we want to be able to provide.
The lead minority member of the Senate Transportation and Public Safety Committees, Senator John Peterson, joins me right now to talk a little bit about transportation issues. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate You're it. Welcome. I appreciate you having me on. Senator, I want to begin with the same question that I asked Senator Dibble at the end of his interview. In your opinion, do you think Minnesota is at a crossroads in terms of transportation funding? Uh, sure. You know, I think Minnesotans uh, are going to have that debate. I think they're looking forward to that debate. You know, I've come out of local government. I served on a city council in St. Cloud for two terms, and we frequently did uh, surveys of our residents in St. Cloud. And I'll tell you, transportation is always at the top of the list right after public safety. And, and so it's a debate that I, I think I'm looking forward to have, and Minnesotans are looking forward us to having in this upcoming session because there are some real, real needs that they're expecting uh, their government, their state government to get addressed. And let's talk about when you think those discussions should take place. You referenced this upcoming session. It's not a budget year, however, given the shortfalls that are projected. I believe it's uh, $250 million will be gone just from some trunk highway funds and some federal dollars that go away the next fiscal cycle. So do you think this is a conversation and action needs to be taken next session or can it wait another year? Well, I think we can start the conversation this session and of course transportation funding just doesn't have to do with revenue, it has to do with reform. There's some real things we can do uh, within the Minnesota Department of Transportation and really all state agencies because what's going on in our state agencies uh, is the same thing that's going on in the private sector businesses and employers we have uh, thousands and thousands of staff members that are going to be retiring, quite frankly, in the next decade. And if we, as legislators, and, and, and if the governor uh, misses this opportunity to reform how state services are delivered uh, to our constituents and to our residents, uh, for example, you know, I'm of the opinion the Department of Transportation could operate just as well as a construction management agency rather than right now as a construction design agency. We could push much of the road design into the private sector, get competitive bids, save money, reform how the state agency is operated and how we deliver our services of providing roads and bridges. And so to that point, that's, a, that's an interesting idea. So do you believe then that the Department of, of transportation could work with the funds that are available as opposed to trying to raise any revenue? Well, I think there is there is needs for both, but I, I would uh, encourage Minnesota, I know Minnesotans are going to be expecting us to talk about reform because uh, just because of that reason, we have a huge, huge opportunity. Another area for reform is public-private partnerships is kind of a, a word that folks have been hearing about um, where we involve the private sector uh, in a number of different ways to provide funding for roads that uh, that work to meet the needs of our residents and our business community and our, our local economies as well. Let's talk about some of the funding mechanisms that have been suggested in the past year. We've heard the possibility of more min pass lanes. We've heard possibility of some toll roads, including the bridge, the bridge that goes from Minnesota into Wisconsin, the new Stillwater Bridge. We've heard wheelage tax, gas tax, motor vehicle registration tax, all increases. Which would you support and which wouldn't you? You have supported wheelage in the past. Um, well, I'm of the opinion that, that most residents and Minnesotans are, uh, quite frankly, don't have the stomach yet for, for a lot of new revenue. And we saw that clearly this last session as the governor came out very loudly against the gas tax and I don't think public opinion has changed on that. You know the other dedicated funding we have for roads of course are the motor vehicle sales tax as well as this, um, the license tab fees and again I just don't think Minnesotans are ready for and uh, can afford significant increases in those areas. Now when it comes to new revenue um, I'll tell you the general fund is, uh, is, is a huge fund of money that has a lot of flexibility and I think the legislature and the governor are going to miss an opportunity if they don't use some general fund dollars to increase funding for transportation. You know, for example, you know this last budget, we uh, raised our raised revenue by about $2 billion, and there was little or no increase in funding for roads and bridges in our transportation system, but yet uh, um, it has been done before, and I think it ought to be done again, and we can... Uh, uh, we can raise additional revenue or use revenue from the general fund to meet our transportation needs, which I'll tell you, I think Minnesotans are expecting. Well, and according to the Transportation Funding Advisory Committee, which was put together by Governor Dayton, yep. it's projecting a $21 billion shortfall over the next 20 years just to maintain transportation as it currently sits. So 
Would you advocate then just trying to keep it, keep things status quo, for uh, lack of a better term, or, or do you think perhaps there's even more money that can be found to yeah. try to advance transportation? Yeah. No, I, I do think there's more money that can be found. Uh, for example, the public-private partnership issue I mentioned, um, there's real opportunity there where, for example, we can ask the private market, private financing funds uh, um, to use their dollars, and of course they want a return. Uh, they want an interest rate paid back to them for using their money to build roads, for example. So it's it's very similar to like a general obligation bond, which we cannot use bonding for state roads, but we can for local roads and bridges. So it's very similar to that scenario where we would use money or borrow money from the private sector, use our regular state budget and our regular tax dollars to make the payments back to these private funds and it's a way to build roads, uh, expand our transportation system and move our economy forward uh, uh, with with the construction of roads and additional lanes that, that our residents need and want. And Senator, we're just about out of time. Senator Dibble, chair of your committee, yep. did say he's open to ideas and he wants to hear what people have to say. Have you talked to him about your, your reform proposals? Uh, yep, Senator Dibble have talked uh, and I have talked a couple times through the summer on, on a number of different issues uh, in regards to our transportation system, uh, primarily about the reforms. Um, Any appetite? Um, I think for the reforms, uh, there is Senator Dibble. I appreciate his approach and uh, he talks a lot about uh, us being one Minnesota and trying to address the needs of many uh, through our transportation system and I don't don't disagree with there. I, I appreciate his, his willingness to discuss and and uh, I, I think he'll uh, see that from me as well as we move into next session. Okay, I'm sure we'll be watching the committee closely throughout session. Thank you for joining us. You're we welcome. appreciate it. Yeah, please call anytime. Checking for and removing weeds from one's watercraft and then wiping it dry are just a couple of ways to try and stop the spread of aquatic invasive species. But there are more. The Department of Natural Resources defines invasive species as species that are not native to Minnesota and cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. Current invasive species on the radar of the DNR include zebra mussels, Eurasian milfoil, common buckthorn, and emerald ash borer. Now invasive species can occur on land or in the water. DNR Commissioner Tom Landwehr recently sat down with us to discuss this issue. This is one of those, especially with zebra mussels, this is one of those issues where we really need to uh, make uh, users of our lakes aware of their personal responsibility. You know, uh, we believe that most invasive species, uh, zebra mussels, uh, curly leaf pondweed and so on, are probably transported by people moving a boat from one lake to another. Not the only cause, but one of the big causes. So uh, we can't inspect, you know, every 800,000 boats that made 5 million uh, landings last year, we really have to rely on boaters to, to do their inspections. So when they come out of the uh, out of the lake, when they come up on the ramp, you know, they should check their trailers, they should make sure there's no vegetation hanging on it, they should make sure the plug is out of their boat, they should empty their live well, they should empty their bait buckets, and just make sure that they're not the person who's hauling an invasive species from one body of water to another. And, and so, it, you know, the statutes really rest on that uh, personal responsibility component, and that's the message that we've got to people, is we will try to make it easy for you to do the right thing, but you're still going to have to do the right thing. And you've been spreading that message for quite some time now. Do you think the education is making an impact? You know, last year our conservation officers reported about a 20 percent violation rate, and so there were a lot of, you know, that's a totally unacceptable violation rate, by the way, uh, whether people weren't pulling their bolt plugs, whether they had uh, weeds hanging from their trailers, whatever it was, it was an unacceptable violation rate. Uh, this year so far we're hearing it's about a 10 percent violation rate. Now I would tell you that it's still way more than what's acceptable but that's a, you know a 50 percent reduction in one year so I think that's that's pretty good indication that people are getting the information and frankly it's kind of hard for me to believe that people wouldn't be. I mean I drove up to uh, International Falls over the weekend I don't know how many times I passed a sign that said you know stop aquatic invasive species. We did a, a little uh, press conference out on a landing in Hastings last week where we've we've got a you know the next generation of uh, boat landing it's going to have a place for you to pull aside to uh, make sure your boat is clean. We're going to have a compost uh, bin there so you can put the vegetation in. So we're, we're really trying to make it you know, obvious to people what they need to do and easy for them to do the right things. Moving on to uh, Asian carp, another species you're trying to fight. The University of Minnesota's Aquatic Invasive Species Center just received $8.7 million from the LCCMR to help develop new technologies. How far do you think this money can go towards keeping Asian carp out of the water? Well, you know, it's, 
we really are counting on research a lot because all of the things that we've talked about, you know, boats with zebra mussels or putting in barriers to slow down uh, Asian carp are really things that just slow the spread. But ultimately, the, you know, they're still getting into places we don't want them to. If we want to get rid of them, we're going to need some new tools. Why do you think it's important to fund millions of dollars, hours of manpower on fighting these species? I mean, does the harm that they create warrant the resources that are used? You know, and that is a very good question, maybe something that a lot of people don't understand. When you look at the impact of the variety of uh, invasive species, and it ranges from plants like curly leaf pondweed to zebra mussels to Asian carp, each one is different, but the, the bottom line for all of them is that they tend to displace the native species, the native ecosystem. So in the case of curly leaf pondweed, it'll, it'll kill out the desirable vegetation. It'll become mats and mats of vegetation that's a challenge for boaters and swimmers. In the case of zebra mussels, they filter feed. They take out the uh, nutrients in the water column, which, you know, in Lake Erie cleaned up the lake, that's great, but at the end of the day, they also kind of destroy that food pyramid that our native species are going to rely on the minnows and ultimately the walleyes and the, and the fish that we like. And in the case of Asian carp, again, they displace the native species by feeding on the same food that the native species do. So in all cases, you know, they don't eliminate sort of the biology of an ecosystem, but they change it in such a way that most Minnesotans would find that to be not a desirable outcome. So will those be the focuses, the areas of focus next session for you? Um, you know, I think the we've got much of the authority we need for that. The problem is, is, is in many things is funding. And it's not that the funding isn't there, it's just we have to get it directed in the right place. So you'll see that through the uh, Outdoor Heritage Fund, the Lasard Sam's Outdoor Heritage Council, uh, the Board of Water and Soil, uh, Board of Water and Soil Resources and DNR will be putting in a collaborative $40 million proposal to do grassland restoration. And, uh, um, and that if we get that kind of resources, we can be doing the right things out there. Of course, we got a, a nice uh, uh, set of authorities and funding for groundwater from the legislature this year, and much of that will be used out in uh, uh, the agricultural part of the state. And uh, you know, going back to a, a previous discussion, we submitted a proposal to LCCMR for the trust fund for $5 million for aquatic invasive species as well to do some of the grants to uh, local units of government. So we're looking at these dedicated funding sources as being really the resources we need to uh, address these emerging challenges. Okay, Commissioner Tom Landworth, thanks for taking so much time to speak with us. We appreciate it. It's my pleasure. The Legislative Citizen Commission on Minnesota Resources is tasked with funding environmental projects using the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. Last session, roughly 30% of the budget went to the fight of against invasive species. And joining me right now is a member of the LCCMR, Senator John Hoffman, to talk about their work. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me here. It's a fun topic and a good topic and a, an important topic. Agreed. And Senator, let's begin with last session. Again, roughly 30% of the budget of the $38 million budget was used to fight invasive species. Why do you think the, why did the LCCMR believe that this issue warranted such a large amount? Well, you know, seven priorities exist within the LCCMR and, and one of them happens to be specifically the Aquatic Invasive Species, AIS, as a priority. When you look at Minnesota in general, I mean, we're the land of 10,000 lakes, you know, lots of ponds, I suppose, too, but our lifeline in Minnesota for years has been about the outdoors. Here we are in Minnesota, and, and, uh, and what are we doing this summer is looking at what's important for us in the state. Well, water's an important piece for us, and I'm just going to focus in on the aquatic invasive species side of it. You know, we see this Eurasian, Eurasian milfoil taking over our lakes, and you see the LCCMR with, through its um, money to organizations such as the University of Minnesota, where they get this little bow weevil, and it chews down the Eurasian milfoil, and it keeps that at bay. Well, you know, you also get a, an issue with the little sunfish that happen to like the bow weevil. So, you know, you're dealing with everything that has to do with water, everything that has to do with Minnesota. And I think a priority that we all share a same uh, outcome for, which is the outdoors. And yet zebra mussels have been found just recently as July in the whitefish chain of lakes and in Latoka near Alexandria. So the fight is obviously far from over. There's another $29 million from the LCCMR that could be available, that is available, excuse me, beginning July 1st of 2014. Do you think invasive species will warrant a big chunk of that cash again? Oh, absolutely. I think you're starting to see people realizing, and I know one of the site visits the LCCMR did was up uh, Mille Lacs, and, and they looked at some of the issues that concerning there. Well, 
downstream from Mille Lacs is, is the Rum River that meets where the uh, uh, Mississippi River happens to be Anoka and then into Champlin. And, you know, you got some last uh, stop, uh, not only for the zebra mussel, but also for, you know, the, the uh, big-headed carp, which, of course, is the big head and the, uh, the uh, flying fish that... Uh, the Asian carp. Silver, the silver, silver and the big-headed, yep, correct. So do you think, given the spread of these invasive species, aquatic in particular, do you think that more money is the answer or is it more education? Is it a combination of both? Obviously there's no silver bullet, but wh what direction would you like to see the LCCMR and the DNR go? Well, you know, we tried last year to get a couple of the decal, which is an education, I mean, it's both components. You need to have some enforcement, but you also need to educate folks, not only from Minnesota, but folks coming in from out of state. You know, what are you carrying? You see that all the time. Good public information that's out there. Uh, I think if you beef that up so it becomes just an everyday conversation like we're having right here, then I think you're going to get to the bottom line, which is, um, you know, the, the outcome or the goal, getting less and less uh, of those aquatic invasive species, it's specifically, like you talked about, the zebra mussels carrying and along. DNR Commissioner Tom Landwehr said that he believed Minnesota's prairies are in dire need of some restoration. It's the area he thinks Minnesota is actually failing in its quest to preserve the environment. Is this on the radar at all for the LCCMR? You know, uh, my short tenure, uh, I've, there's a couple of projects out there that, that are connected with that I've seen. Um, and we'll be interested to see the 2014, some of the RFPs that went out and folks that are going to be requesting a dollars to see if, if there are some prairie stuff. You know, there's, there's also, there's some trust land pieces out there too that folks are being involved in. And I think uh, he's probably correct. You know, when you focus so much on, on waters and streams, you know, you lose sight of, 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 the, of the prairie out there. So uh, trying to find a balance, I think, is going to be an important case for 2014. Okay, Senator, I want to ask you, Commissioner Landwehr also stated that shortly after his appointment, he was asked, why does the environment matter? And he stated, the natural environment is our goose laying golden egg, especially in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So based on what you've seen, site visits and such, do you believe Minnesota's golden egg is still gold, or do you think it's tarnished a bit? You know, it's still golden, but I think uh, we tried to, to write some priorities here um, and, and have had lacked that for, for previous years. When you look at 40% of our lakes and streams are, are uh, in dire need of some clean water, when you look at our Clean Water Accountability Act that I was the chief author on this year, it helped get to those point sources of pollution and, and helped the, the DNR and, and the board of, board of Soil and Water and the Pollution Control agencies work collaboratively in order to address some of those issues that are out there. And so I think we're still the golden goose, um, but uh, the golden egg of the golden goose, or however he states it. But I think we need to refocus where our priorities are in Minnesota. And you know what? Make the investment. Why can't we make more of an investment in that? I, I'm okay with that. Senator, I mean, we owe it to our, with our, our future. And I didn't mean to cut you I, off no, there. I'm sorry about that. No, absolutely not. Senator John Hoffman, we certainly hope to get you back on, this, on the show closer to session. I have a feeling you'll be authoring some new legislation. It'll be a fun year. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes this week's program. I'm Julie Barkey. Thank you for watching.